you know, when people uh, suspected what he had in mind. That's when things started to become, how shall I say, dangerous for us. You know, people were afraid of what he was planning to do. And then, of course, he pretty early on started going east and getting some of these territories back that had been taken from us after like the... Like the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. how did you guys feel? In 1938, were you wary it, 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 that another war was going to break out, or? Well, uh, not right away, but then um, it really happened almost overnight. And uh, we, we were, well, in my family, maybe there were other families that knew more about it, but in my family, we didn't know. And I remember it, it started on a, a Sunday morning and the radio announced that the troops had moved into Poland. Mm -hmm. And right away they said we would have ration cards. So my mother sent us downstairs in, in the apartment house where we lived. There was a, a ma and pa store down there, a little grocery store. Okay. And she wrote a list. Oh, she thought she was going to hamster a lot of food, you know, like a half a pound of butter oh, wow. <laughs> and two pounds of sugar. And then she figured it all up. How much is that going to cost me? Oh, well, you better make that a quarter pound of butter, <laughs> you know, this kind of stuff. We went to the back door of these people, knowing them that they were our co-work uh, people that lived in the house. <laughs> When I came home with that bag full of food there, my mother was happy that she had, you know, uh, succeeded in, in hamstring some, a few things. Well, especially when the rations are coming in, yes. And that pretty much went on all through the war. <laughs> so what kind of news did you guys listen to I, when they talked about what was happening with the war on the radio or in the newspapers? How we aware were, were not, you of... We, you know, we were capable of uh, listening to every European radio station and even short circuit to Africa. And we were not supposed to do that. That was a offense against the government. Wow. And many, many nights, evenings, my family sat there and turning the radio on and crawling literally <laughs> into the radio to be able to hear it because they didn't want to turn the, the volume up. Uh, but in the morning before we went to school, we were told, don't you tell anyone what we did last night. And this is how we got our news. Uh, True news, news, you know, as it happened. So and these things were so the real actions of the war, the real campaigns, weren't really being truthfully reported. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh -huh. Impressive. It it was uh, it was hard times, but and you then realized, you know, that you were not really uh, free to do what you what you used to do or what you would like to do that there was a dictatorship and it had gotten a foothold in the uh, in the country and uh, whoever didn't people were arrested for for telling each other in a workshop for instance in a factory if people told each other off-color jokes about politics or about hitler they could be arrested and sent to a, a concentration camp in fact, I had a friend, a, a girlfriend. I didn't meet her when we were here. And she was from Frankfurt, and she spent a year in prison because she told a joke to somebody about the Nazis. And she spent a year in prison? Yeah. Remarkable. Later on, she had all kinds of benefits when Hitler was out of power because she was pers pursued by Hitler's government. You know. <laughs> wow. So how did the atmosphere of Germany change then as the war started to progress? Like when the United States became involved with the failure of the Russian camp or the Soviet campaign? Yeah. Well, um, we were, as I said, we were 
really, uh, how shall I say, was suspicious uh, for a long time. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, every, uh, ever so often, you had actual proof that things that you suspected were really actually happening. And when we heard that the United States had entered into the war, everybody was thankful. This is the end of the war. We can't. This is too much for us. We can't, you know, fight that, that much force. And everybody was relieved. There was another Sunday when that happened, and uh, we were in a in a in a pool. In a, in a it was summer, and we were in a pool, and everybody was hugging each other. And the people said, "Oh my God, it's over," you know. Once the United States lasted right. a little while, yeah. So. I guess the next logical question would be, was everybody feeling this way, though? I mean, no, there were, were there people, still people holding the banner? There were people banner. that benefited from the Nazi party. If you were a member from the very beginning, mm -hmm. you had a golden party uh, uh, emblem that you put in your, your pel lapel. These people sat in positions where they were directors of a bank, they were in, in, in uh, you know, out, um, what do you call this? Uh, I forget the name now. But they had good positions and they had only to gain from being Nazi and being openly Nazi. And they made use of that as long as they could, you know. But then when the, f when the uh, Allied troops started coming in, then, of course, we knew that things were going to be shortly over with, you know. But yeah, it still took four more years for that to actually come to fruition. Yeah, yeah. How aware, and I know that this is a very touchy subject for a lot of people, how aware was the German public about what was happening in the concentration camps or the work camps? Was this reported? We knew they existed, but we didn't know about the uh, about the, the cruel way in which these people were uh, exterminated, you know. We knew there were, uh, now, I didn't live near one of those. Right, because uh, you were on uh, the western side of Germany, right. But you heard the rumors, you heard the rumors, and you had, we had uh, Jewish friends. And they all of a sudden disappeared, you know. Well, you knew what happened to them. I mean, that they were in a concentration camp. For instance, when I went to school, and I was about, well, we had, we had religion as a subject in school all through Hitler's time. But that religion consisted of more of the history of religions. Not the actual practice than it of. Did the actual thing. However, when we, that was before Hitler came into power, when we had religion, we split up in different classrooms, and one room had a rabbi that came, uh, another one was a Catholic priest, a, a Protestant minister, and so on and so on. They split us up, you know. And then all of a sudden, the Jewish kids disappeared one by one by one because their parents uh, left Germany if they could. If they could, which was very difficult for a lot of Jewish and families And that's where my father comes in. He worked in a federal bank in the money exchange, foreign money exchange, and he dealt with a lot of Jewish people that were rich, doctors, lawyers, or business people, mm -hmm. and they couldn't, if they left Germany, they could only take a small amount of money with them, and they tried everything under the sun to to uh, circumvent that. And, and the system, yeah. Yeah, and he, my father was handicapped. He couldn't, as a federal uh, employee, he was not, wouldn't dare do that. But he helped these people in many different ways by uh, getting them in touch with uh, people from foreign countries, uh, their relatives, and so on and so on. And they were forever grateful. Now, they sent to my parents' address big baskets of food and, and uh, wine and uh, liquor and so on and so on. 
It just delivered it. They are not supposed to say where it comes from, the delivery people said. And my father couldn't accept that. If he would have, it, it would have been, been a serious problem. Yes, it would know. have been a serious offense so. if he said, okay, yes, I actually did do this. I know. I know. Wow. So what was it like towards the end of the war, though, with you have the Soviet Union? I'm, I'm assuming you were still there in 1945, correct? It, it seemed, you were still there in 1945 at the end oh of the yeah, war? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what was that like with the Allies pushing from the West and the Soviets coming from the East? Well, we were, we were waiting every day to hear who would reach us first. The, now, the Soviets, now there is a story all by itself. My relatives lived in East Prussia, my mother's family, right. in East Prussia. That East Prussia was, of course, because Hitler took that Polish corridor that was formed to allow Poland and a uh, harbor to the Baltic Sea. Right. Uh, he took that corridor and made it German. And my aunt, she had four boys and wanted a little girl really bad. And uh, finally they had this little girl. But her husband, meanwhile, was in the army in France, in the Western Front. So she had no contact with him, but she knew she had to flee or the Russians would come in and they, they were raping women and they were, it was a horrible situation. Well, everybody tried to flee. She was scheduled to go on the last ship out from Gdansk, which is, it was Danzig right. then, now it's Gdansk. Right. And she was scheduled to go there and they said, too many people on it already, you can't get on it. They put her on a freight train with open cars, freight cars, in the middle of winter with these children. And she did not have milk for this newborn, uh, not enough after a few days. Right. And it died in her arms. So she didn't want to give it up. I mean, and somebody, a German officer who was in charge of this transport, he wanted to know, what do you got in the blanket here? And people said, it's her dead child. He said, we can't have that. He took the child and threw it out the train. My goodness. That's horrific. But this was the, what I'm going to come to understand is almost a normal experience for most They were people. on the road for 18 days from East Prussia. There was normally a 12-hour train trip by fast train, 12 hours. And it took 18 days because it took these um, trains uh, when there was a, uh, uh, an army transport coming through, they took these refugee uh, trains and set them aside for days. No water, no food, no nothing. They were, they were fortunate they were alive when they, they came to us and we didn't have no ration cards for them. And then she, she came with not only her four children that were left, but a young girl that was assigned to her to help her with the children because Hitler wanted women to have a lot of kids, you yes. know. And every woman with four children or more uh, got assigned a, um, a nanny, you okay. know. And she fled with her also. So they stayed at our door and wanted to camp with us. Well, we took them in, of course, slept on the floor and everything and then tried to straighten it out because she was supposed to go to the British zone. And uh, she didn't, she said, I have my sister here. I, I want to stay with them, you know. Oh, you got to go to a British, uh, she went to Osnabrück uh, in the British zone, you know. And my grandmother came the same way. She had to close up her apartment turn the key and walk away from everything she had except what she could carry in two bags and a rucksack. And she came with double pneumonia and wanted to stay with us. And, and they, they, they didn't allow that either, but then eventually my dad threw connections. That, that's what you needed to exist, to, to, to stay alive, connections. Somebody to the Nazi to party. Yeah, there you go. Wow. Yeah, that, that's the way it went. <laughs> So how did things go down then? 
in the spring of 1945. What do you remember well, about that? Well, uh, we were fortunate. We were fortunate because uh, we were in the southwestern part of Germany. There was no, no place for us to go. People would say, are you going to leave when the enemy, the enemy, whoever he was, Whether comes. it be Allied or Soviet at that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wh whoever comes, where, will it, where are we going to go? We are going to be in France. Now <laughs> that's foreign country. So we couldn't go no place. So everybody thought we were fortunate because we were literally forced to stay in our places, you know, in our homes. And that's the way it was. And we were fortunate that the Americans came first. That was almost like a big victory, even though they bombarded the town. We had been evacuated because in Stuttgart, where we lived and where I was raised, we had air raid. Uh, uh, damage, lots of it. I can imagine. And we had no windows, no doors in the place, and finally my father, again through connections, <laughs> uh, found um, a, a worker of, that worked for him, a, a man that worked for him in the bank, and his wife was a Swiss citizen. And they had a little three apartment house outside in the suburbs, far out. And he was willing to rent this to us, and we moved there. So we didn't live in the city of Stuttgart anymore. And that was our fortune, because when the foreign troops came in to occupy us, it happened to be the Americans, and right next to our house was a railroad overpass, and that was the border between the American troops and the French troops. So you're the fortunate French to get the troops Americans. had occupied the city, the big city. And